The far right, it seems, is on the rise in Europe. Extremist groups have capitalised on people's suffering from government austerity plans and turned this into unprecedented success at the polls. From Marine Le Pen on the National Front in France to the Golden Dawn in Greece, ultra-nationalist groups are entering mainstream politics, bringing their racist and Islamophobic ideologies with them. But what about here in the UK? Hello and welcome to Eyewitness, I'm John Rees. Well, on the face of it, things seem quite different. The far-right British National Party was all but wiped off the political map last week when it suffered heavy losses in the local elections. But protest groups, such as the English Defence League, are still making a lot of noise. This weekend, the EDL held what it called a homecoming rally in Luton, celebrating three years of its existence. But they were met by over a thousand protesters from local community, mosques and anti-fascist organisations. Alex Crutcher reports. 2,000 people took to the streets of Luton this weekend to counter a demonstration by the English Defence League. The website for the extremist organisation called it a homecoming, but they were met by protests as people united under the banner of We Are Luton, enraged by their town's continued association with the group. As the EDL crowds dispersed, leaving a trail of scattered beer cans in their wake, people were left to consider just how potent had the UK's far right become. A glance at recent events in Europe gives a worrying indication that far right anti-Muslim entities are on the rise. From Gert Wilders in the Netherlands and Marine Le Pen, champion of the French National Front, to Greece's neo-Nazi Golden Dawn, ultra-nationalist parties are having unprecedented success at the polls. But can the same be said for the UK? In last week's local elections, the British National Party lost all six of the council seats it was defending. By contrast, however, the UK Independence Party had a record success, and the EDL's presence in Luton this weekend was a chilling reminder of the group's ability to take their message of hate to the streets. But their campaigns are also checked at every turn. One of the clearest examples of this was when the group's founder, Tommy Robinson, started a creeping Sharia hashtag on Twitter. Intended to highlight examples of a Muslim takeover of Britain, the trend soon turned into a farce, as mocking netizens cited everything from the name of a well-known bingo chain to the Queen's choice of headscarf as examples of encroaching Sharia law in the UK. While the EDL is rightly the subject of mockery, their influence is impossible to deny. We see the same crusader imagery replicated by extremists across Northern Europe. Economic austerity, cuts to public services and a crisis in affordable housing will also provide a breeding ground for extremist views as poor communities suffer. The EDL should not, therefore, be dismissed so lightly, but they are being openly met, derided and challenged by a diverse anti-movement. Joining me in the studio today is blogger and activist Salim Gafour and Simon Asaf from the group Unite Against Fascism. I'm also pleased to welcome journalist Flavia Zozan from uh, Amsterdam. Um, she'll be joining us on the phone. Uh, Flavia has written extensively about the rise of the far right in Europe. Uh, thanks to you all for, uh, for coming along. Um, Simon, first of all, um, it looks from the election results as if the far right, the BNP, are in a crisis. And the demonstration that the EDL held, well, it wasn't the biggest demonstration they've ever held at the weekend. So the British far right in a bit of a crisis, perhaps? The, the, the fascist and Nazi element of it definitely are in, are in a big crisis. If we think back uh, four or five years ago, the BNP had uh, 58 council seats. It seemed they, they, they won MEPs for North East and North West. They were... They were getting onto the BBC question time. They seemed to be entering the mainstream. And it was, I, I think, at that time when the kind of anti-fascist movement really began to, to grow and to throw itself into opposition to it actually meant that on the ground they were, fed, they were met constantly with, uh, with opposition, criticism and so on. And so they weren't able to have the kind of uh, the, the clear path that I think the French National Front had in the 1980s and so on. And I, I think this is quite important. Um, so, so, so that's the good news. Uh, the same with the EDL. When they emerged three years ago, they almost seemed unstoppable. I think we were trying to count the amount of counter-mobilizations we've had. I think it was something around 87 of the last three years of 
demonstration after demonstration after demonstration, and they seemed unstoppable, I think, at one point, but again, uh, managed to check them. And so you can then say, okay, you look across the continent, uh, everything's bad here, everything's fine in Britain, so we can all go home. But then you see the other signs that I think are quite worrying. One is Islamophobia is extraordinarily strong. There's no signs of it being weakened. Um, and the second thing is that there are other smaller organizations that seem to be stepping up to fill the gap. So there's the English Democrats who are beginning to appear. But I think more importantly for, for, for us here is UKIP and the way in which UKIP is trying to suck up the votes from the extreme far right, use the kind of Gert Wilder style and anti-Muslim stuff. So, so, so yes, we have good news, but at the same time, there's nothing really to, to celebrate because you see across Europe and in Britain, the, the threat remains very, very strong. Sanam, you were one of the people that organised the counter demonstration in, in Luton at the weekend, and Luton has been at the centre of this uh, of this since the EDL began. There, well, what what was the feeling like on the demonstration, and what's the feeling like in, in Luton now around the whole question of the EDL? Yeah, well, um, what the demonstration was on Saturday. The EDL will say they probably had about ten thousand people attend, but we know that's not true. They probably had ten thousand cans of Stella, but uh, no, they didn't get ten thousand. They probably got about a thousand. So they did still have some people attending. It wasn't as bad as it was three years ago, um, but the opposition, we outnumbered them three to one. So we had people from Nottingham, we had people come over from Wales, we had people come over from Glasgow, um, and when we asked them why did you come all the way, they said we'll fight fascism um, wherever it is. So yeah, we had quite a lot of um, people come to turn out. Mm. And, and the atmosphere in the town now, do the people in the town feel that they're getting past the point where the EDL seem to be identified with, with, with Luton. Is that something that you think the demonstration achieved? Oh, well, yeah, because Tommy Robinson, he's always saying, I'm from Luton, this is what's happening in Luton. It's, uh, it's, the town has been Islamified. Um, but a lot of the people who spoke at our rally said, no, I'm from Luton, and Tommy Robinson doesn't speak for me. Luton isn't a hotbed for militant Islam. Uh, Tommy Robinson, his whole thing is with militant Islam and extremism, but we know that's not the case because he's got a problem with how Muslim women dress, he's got a problem with the burqa, he's got a problem with halal meat, he's got a problem with um, mosques being built. So it, it's, I think people now are starting to realise that his sly uh, racism and his prejudice against Islam isn't actually, you know, it's, it's not just a problem with uh, extremism he's going on about, it's a problem uh, he's got with Islam and people are starting to realise they need to combat that. Mm. Flavio, let me bring you into the discussion now. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, it, it seems to be a significantly bigger political problem now, at least from what we've seen in France uh, and Greece. Do you think that's true? And if you do, what's the explanation? Well, I think that what a lot of these organisations, like the EDL in the UK, um, like Herr Wilders here in, in the Netherlands have done, is put a lot of these issues into the mainstream agenda. They might be fringe for us locally at, at the moment. However, the ideas that they have been predicating for the past five to ten years have now become part of the agenda in legitimate political parties. And, and that, I think, is very dangerous. And so do you see this as something that's been generated by, uh, by the mainstream? Because there was a lot of talk about of the way in which uh, Sarkozy uh, opened up the, uh, the ground for Marine Le Pen. Well, he did, exactly. I mean, these ideas, uh, prior to 9-11, to 2001, these ideas were very fringe. And nobody, would, nobody actually debated or, or took them seriously. They were seen as well the realm of just very small and, and very isolated extreme groups. What has been happening systematically in the past 10 years is that they have become mainstream. We are no longer in a position to say, no, this cannot be questioned. Mm. You know, it's like the Islamophobia in different degrees, because in, in some groups it's more subtle, it's more, you know, it's done in the name of uh, saving women, for instance, or the rights of women. But the, the underlying sentiment is the same. Mm. Simon, let me, let, let's explore this a little bit more, because there, there clearly is a powerful relationship between what the political mainstream is doing and what the, uh, the, the fascist and the Islamophobic uh, right are, are doing. Perhaps in a way, I mean, this relationship was always true with the Nazis, but, I mean, if you look back at the National Front in the 1970s, certainly they grew from Enoch Powell's River of Blood speech, but Powell himself was sacked 
um, as a member of the shadow cabinet by the Tories. What's happening now? New democracy in Greece are at it. Sarkozy's at it. These are the these are the mainstream of the political parties. Their leaderships are now propagating this. Do you think that's one of the things that's that's allowing these groups to, even when they're beaten, to to, to recreate themselves? Yes, because, because it's the the general kind of toxic atmosphere that allows them to grow. This is the thing. I mean, p part of what the the kind of mainstream politicians that try and justify, they say, well, these are the real concerns of white people. But let's leave that aside whether that's true or not. But they, they will pick up and say, these are real concerns about immigration, Islamophobia, our culture, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, and therefore then make it legitimate to put things in those terms. And of course, the, there is a difference between your street thug, you know, attacking a young Asian or young black guy and your mainstream politician. But, but by, by making it acceptable, uh, this general atmosphere of Islamophobia actually means that these groups then, you know, they don't have that, they don't feel isolated. I mean, when people talk about the 1970s and the anti-Nazi League at the time, the National Front, um, when the National Front were beaten on the streets and then electorally, uh, the, the, if you think of the, the kind of 1980s, it became almost embarrassing for politicians to be accused of being racist. You know, it became a thing they hid more and more from. I don't get that feeling at the moment. I don't get the feeling that there is this kind of uh, uh, let's be careful what we say or anything. I, just, I get the feeling of Sarkozy with the rest of them, to be honest with you, that it is um, that they're kind of adding fuel to this, constantly adding fuel to it, and it will allow the groups to, to re-emerge. I mean, the thing we have to remember about England, um, one of the reasons I'm, I'm, I'm very happy is because the BNP did really badly. But my great concern is, where did the EDL come from? Mm -hmm. It seems like they appeared over a weekend. And actually, because they appeared out of that atmosphere, suddenly they were there, suddenly they were growing extremely fast, and, and so on. So the, there's absolutely no room for complacency whatsoever. And you, and you think, that, you know, what's happening across the rest of the continent, you, you can see them regenerating constantly. You see this constant attempt for them to regenerate, find the right uh, formula, I think, for the ultra, for the fascists and the ultra right to, 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 to grow again. And I think, uh, I think they see, uh, they, they will breathe this atmosphere of, of Islamophobia. I mean, Salam, when you were involved with the whole creeping Sharia hashtag uh, on um, uh, on Twitter, I mean, one of the things that it showed is that um, there's a there's a there's a deep, broad reservoir of opposition to these kind of, these kind of ideas, and it was I mean, it was you know th that trended on Twitter. It it, it it really suddenly, in a humorous way, expressed that that reservoir of, of opposition. Do you think? Yeah, it definitely did. It showed that people actually, they didn't believe uh, Tom Robinson's lies and hatreds that he preaches. They took uh, the English Defence League as a joke. Um, so it was a picture of a mosque that he said, oh, this is creeping Sharia coming in. Twitter homepage has a picture of a mosque as though uh, the Muslims have infiltrated social networking sites. Um, so it was quite funny to see, you know, if it was a picture of New York or if it was a picture of China, he wouldn't have said, oh, this is China trying to take over. So the whole thing would just uh, turn into a, a bunch of ridicule to to Tommy Robinson um, and the English Defence League, yeah. Have you got any sense of exactly h how big that was? I mean, I know the article that you wrote had I know, 11,000 shares or something, but, but overall, the whole, the whole hashtag, have you got... Uh, well, it trended worldwide for, um, for, for about two days, I think, altogether. Mm. So, um, yeah, it did, a lot of people So there must be it. millions of people involved yeah, in reading yeah. those, isn't there? Yeah. Um, Flavia, can I ask you a question now about the... The, the relationship between the kind of thug elements, the street fighting elements of the far right and the, and the, and the electoral wing, because it was said for a while about uh, Marine Le Pen and Le Pen's National Front be, uh, before she was leader, when her father was leader, that this was the sort of Euro-fascist model, that it was marginalising the sort of street fighting element of Nazism and it was concentrating on presenting a, an, a, an acceptable face to the electorate. But something different seems to have happened in Greece with Golden Dawn, because these are street fighting thugs who have suddenly got for the first time in Europe into a national parliament. Do you, do, you, do you see that as a particularly dangerous development? I do, I do. And I've been following the Greek case for a few months already. Uh, since the euro crisis started, you could see an increase in the number of incidents of street violence against minorities and migrants, uh, visibly um, non-Greek people, amongst our, which are many asylum seekers and refugees. Um, these street files have now got le legitimized through election. They have managed to present a, a front that obviously has some credibility with the electorate. And, well, now they have political representation. What, this, what worries me a lot about this development is how this might translate into policy. And what do you think uh, that might mean? 
Well, for instance, Greece has a number of uh, refugee camps along the Turkish border uh, where they have been questioned by uh, human rights organizations because of the treatment that Kurdish refugees and people escaping from Iraq, you know, from all, all the eastern uh, front who have reached Greece and now they're being housed in conditions that are pretty appalling. And what I'm now afraid what, what might happen is that this might get worse and extended. People who are already out of the camps and living already within uh, Greek cities, what might happen to them? Uh, what fate will they encounter? Because don't forget that now these people have been legitimized to enact these ideas into policy, into action. Mm. Uh, Simon, let's just have a look at that a, a little bit more closely, because in the British case, um, the, the BNP modelled themselves on the Eurocommunists, modelled themselves on Le Pen's uh, National Front. But that whole electoral thing has come crashing down and, to be honest, was on the decline even before this set of results. The EDL, in a way, kind of emerged as, all right, we're going to do the street fighting. But it seems as if they're now, um, well, both both failing in those terms, but also looking at the uh, a, a new electoral initiative, aren't they? Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they are, as I say, they're, they're trying to constantly configure to try and find the kind of key magic formula that, that will allow them to do a France. And, uh, and so on. But, but it, it, in a sense, what we have to do is we have to look at the, the general atmosphere, uh, the economic atmosphere. Um, I mean, the thing about fascism, it being the politics of despair, and, and you see and you look across Greece and you go, you know, this is, this is a street army um, almost preparing itself to be used against a target, probably the anti uh, the anti austerity movement and so on. You can really feel that. And then you look across in Hungary and you see a similar kind of Thing, the, the Jobbic organization, um, and there the main target being, being uh, Roma gypsies and so on. And you can see wherever there is this kind of deep economic crisis and almost social paralysis that these groups are attempting to emerge inside of it. Inside of it. So, so what we're kind of witnessing is, is a sense of repeat of the 1930s, where you'd have both, you know, this kind of rise of these very, very scary, nasty organizations, but at the same time, Kind of mass resistance to it. I mean, we mentioned talking about the the, the the Twitter stuff, and of course, the thing is, is that even though there's a general atmosphere of Islamophobia, there's so much of it is being challenged. It's, it's quite amazing, and actually, it doesn't take much to puncture. And so, I think pe what people are finding, the demonstrations are general demonstrations. The UAF have organised have always been very mixed, anyway. But it's always been, uh, uh, it, uh, but it, uh, and it always seems to pull on that tradition of people who understand the 1970s, who understand the. Um, what happened in the 1930s. I'll tell you a story of how, how it worked when we were out in Barking a few years ago and we were campaigning against the BNP. We were knocking on people's doors because that's what we do, door, knock, uh, knock the door, and we received information that this one particular household was voting BNP. So we went to try and persuade them to change their vote. And to our surprise, it was a black family. And we were like, oh, there must be some kind of mistake. It says here you're voting BNP. And I said, yeah, yes, we are, because of immigration and so on. And the immigrants in this case were what they call the ABCs, Albanians, Bosnians and Kosovans who yeah. were, were, were fleeing Eastern Europe at the time. And it wasn't until we associated the BNP with the National Front that it connected with them exactly who these people were. So, they, so, so, so the, 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 that ability for them to kind of create this uh, you know, illusion of them being you know, quite clean and, and, and nice and so on is, 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 is quite strong. But also its ability to destroy that is also, is also quite important. But, but, but as I say, they are now... You, you see with UKIP, uh, what, what we thought was a bridge for people going into fascist parties, but also a bridge for them to escape into. So quite a lot of the BNP people are now escaping into UKIP mm. as a kind of new umbrella. But you know, politically, they haven't changed their minds. You know, they're still pushing the same, uh, the same kind of stuff. So it's part of, I think, when you stop them in the streets or when you stop overtly Nazi organisations in the ballot box, then you have to also think about the wider questions constantly come. Austerity, mm. resistance and and, and all of that, that that goes with it. I mean, Sam, I mean, one of the things that 
uh, that you know people you know, are actually on the continent and, and way outside this country say is that w one of the things that's 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 helped the, the British situation to be different is the uh, alliance of the uh, of the left of the trade union movement with the Muslim community, which I suppose really f was first part of the anti-war movement. Is that is that how how you see it? Is that functioning in, in, in at ground level in Luton? Yeah, definitely. Well, the anti-war movement they had uh, three main slogans when they first started. First was to stop the war. Second was uh, to stop um, more political restrictions or more restrictions on um, freedom of speech or freedom to, you know, to more security measures. And the third one was to stop the backlash of Islamophobia because obviously if you're going into war in Muslim countries, you're going to feel a backlash um, in the UK. So when they went into um, Afghanistan, in, in Iraq, in Libya, in Somalia, Yemen, the, the, the list just goes on and on. I don't actually have enough mm. fingers for all of those. But, um, yeah, you see uh, when there's these attacks uh, abroad, there's more, um, yeah, there, there's a Islamophobia here as well. So you saw um, with Shema in America, she was a victim of Islamophobia. You've seen uh, what the EDL, if they're not stopped, they can um, prop up the likes of Brevik in Norway. So um, people have started to realise now that this is what the EDL can do. So in Lewisham uh, last week, there was a 69 year old pensioner um, who was handing out uh, leaflets, anti racism and anti fascism leaflets, and he was beaten up. So when people realise the EDL, they're not um, a nice face and they're not, you know, trying to. Uh, help people out or anything and um, they're not just against the immigration uh, they're just the Nazi party they're the oldest uh, the younger sibling rather of the BMP and um, the National Front mm. Flavia, just let me uh, ask you about how stable you think some of the some of the Nazi vote is because without without wanting to minimize the seriousness of it at all it looks in France as if um, a significant section of Marine Le Pen's vote actually then went on to vote for uh, Francois Hollande in the, the socialist candidate in the second round. So uh, uh, do you think it might be a, a vote that's perhaps easy to or or vulnerable to being broken up in that way? Yes, definitely. It, happened, it is happening here in the Netherlands because I can tell you we are having elections here in September and the polls are showing that there is less support for uh, extreme ideas at the moment. Um, I think that people want solutions. I, I, I think that part of Islamophobia, uh, part of the fascism, comes from disillusion, comes from not having needs met. And when those groups do not provide solutions, which we, we know that they don't, but voters eventually become aware of this. And they vote for the group that they think will provide those, those solutions, be it the socialists in France or uh, it looks like the Labour Party might have a chance here in, in the Netherlands or the Green Left. So, yes, I think that they can be broken up. However, what worries me is the unaddressed underlying racism that remains, because they might not vote for that, but those ideas remain brewing in the background. Mm. So do you think that uh, do you think that perhaps it's it's a different condition in Greece because the the depth of the crisis and, and those needs not being met that you're talking about are, are are in for the moment at any rate in a in a different register to the to most of Europe. I think so. Yes, uh, Greece in a, is in a very desperate situation. The, uh, there is a steady rise in suicides, in self harm. Uh, people are feeling the consequences of this crisis in, in very direct and very personal ways. And I'm not talking about not having money for leisure spending. Mm. I'm talking about uh, not having food to eat. And I think that that has um, given way to a, a very serious increase in these fascist and extreme national, nationalist parties that have now gotten elected. Okay. I don't think the rest of Europe is in exactly the same position. OK. Well, I'm afraid that's all that we've got time for uh, this week. My thanks to our guests, Sanam Gafour, Simon Asaf and Flavio Zozan, uh, and for you at home for watching. Um, we'll be online after the show to take your views about what we've been discussing today. So we'll be posting the links to some of the sites and resources that we've been discussing as well. Um, so you can get in touch with us uh, on Twitter at Eyewitness Comment. Thanks very much for watching, watching and we'll see you next time. Thank you.